Good evening, or well just hello generally because it could be any time of day where you are, but it's evening where I am, it's that time of day, um, or evening, or night. Um, yeah, so what I've got in front of me is a Webley Vulcan, it's not mine, it's a Mark 1, um, it belongs to a guy at work and a guy I play rugby with who came down to the indoor range of me um, when I was doing some zero work a couple of weeks back. He was pretty disappointed because he was getting a sort of a 9 inch group in. Um, and then, so if you imagine A4 piece of paper basically, he was hitting the top half only, um, spreading 100 mil on the windage, and then literally probably about six to eight inches on the, uh, well, six, six, six to nine inches on the, the top, easy on the, the elevation on the upper half. Um, the scope he was using at the time was a Nico Sterling from, I don't know when, it was a long time ago. Um, that was a little 4 by 30 I think it was, or 25, no, that would have been 30. Um, the crosshair was damaged, on the, the right one it was snapped, and then on the, the, the upper crosshair it was snapped. It was just held in, in two places by the left and the bottom, so it was more of a quarter um, hair than anything else. He soon changed that, put this nickel on there, didn't really improve anything. Um, I knew it wasn't going to be down to scope, but... Uh, on the way back, I offered to have a look at it for him, you know, or he asked me to have a look at him if I could. Um, I said, yeah, no problem. So let's have a quick look at it before I tell you what I actually did to it. Now, bearing in mind, I haven't had to do major work to it, just a brand new spring. As you can see there, all these little components in this corner here um, are, you know, just the bits that were removed and, and changed. Typical stuff, really. And then a good old re-grease. I over-greased it, in fact, um, so it's still dieseling heavily, you'll see, on that target around the edges of the holes. There's nice bits of black there. But the way I see it is, okay, you know, at first a couple of hundred pellets will be a little bit diesely, but at least it'll get rid of the excess of what it don't need. Um, I'm not a believer in grease. The flash point of it's very, very thin, you know, um, or quite high, so... Um, the serial number of this rifle is, um, I've got it written down there actually, it's a little cheat sheet, is, is on the side on this breech block and it is, if you can make that out, uh, 565181, which I'm guessing is going to be, and this is a pure guess mind, it probably ain't even anywhere near this, it'll be something else, um, but I reckon that would have been rifle 56 um, in week 51 of 1981. Just a guess. If anybody actually knows their system, then that would be that would be nice to know. The overall length of the rifle is 49 inches, and it's got a 17-inch barrel, which again is uh, is quite long. The rest of them, I think, were all carbines after the Mark One. This was the only one that wasn't available in a carbine. It's got a not so squishy. Uh, Backstop, but there's a little bit of movement on it. Butt pad, um, and that's what it looks like. It's a good old 1981 glued on Webley butt pad. Um, you know, it's got sort of rounded edges, which I prefer if it's got a nice fillet on there because it, it basically means it ain't going to catch on the seams of your, your jacket. You know, it's got a semi ambidextrous stock, um, it's probably the best way to describe that. So if you look there, you've got it's a right hand stock you know, with a bit of a recess for your cheek piece. But if you were a lefty, you know, if you can imagine like the air arms and BSAs, I think they're the same. They have this kind of overlap here, which comes up. So if you're a left-handed shooter, it's going to dig into your cheek a little bit. This has got a, you know, a, a rounded piece. So if you're left-handed, you're not going to notice it so much. The stock itself, he's actually took down and, and give it a re-varnish, you know. Um, it's actually done it in a way where it looks quite worn. So it's quite patchy in the way he's done it. He's not done that deliberately, it's just, you know, that's how it's turned out. Um, but there's no sort of Webley engravings or anything on there, you know. Um, he's actually done quite a nice job of it. I think it looks like a little Kentucky Moonshiner style rifle, you know. Which gives it, yeah, I think that makes it look pretty cool. Um, the trigger itself is a really simple mechanism. Um, it's, it is supposed to be adjustable via this screw at the top here. Um, but to be honest, it don't work. I mean, you've got to keep in mind this is 1980s Britain, so you know the welders have gone on strike because people on the assembly line got free milk, um, and they don't. They have to bring theirs in, um, and one of them probably you know just couldn't be bothered to work, so he decided to go on strike with them. Off, you know, this is 1980s Britain, okay. 
Um, Triumph Stag is a perfect example of that. You know, they say it's all down to bad design, this, that, and the other, which I'll go into with this barrel block. But the reality is, it's just poor tolerances, you know, um, and mismachining. So that's why this pin doesn't actually do any adjusting on the trigger. Your Webley Vulcan, if you're watching this, probably does, um, but this one don't. Um, there's no movement on there at all. And I tested that by putting a depth mic, um, you know, and then screwing it all in, and there was no movement on depth mic when that screw stopped turning. Which is why it's now you got a use, you know. Um, now this has to be modified slightly. You can see it's slightly leaning back. Um, there is a, a long-term fix in place for that. I just want to make sure this this goes, and it actually involves doing away with that grub screw anyway. Um, but the trigger itself, yeah, it's quite a nice, simple mechanism, easy to work on, you know. Um, trigger guard here, all metal, you know, a metal plate that goes in there, this two piece, this thing here, it's not all one. Um, on the other side you've got the safety, now this only works when it just slides backwards and forwards basically, and this only works when the rifle's cocked, um, I'll try and get some contrast in the daylight here, or the, the, the light, there you go, yeah and that just literally just slides back and forth once it's cocked, um, you know, very simple, very effective. Um, the cylinder itself um, has got Webley Vulcan either side of the dovetail rails um, etched on there but obviously we've got one piece mount on there now so you can't actually see that um, internally you've got your typical spring um, which goes straight into your piston um, and then on the end of your piston you've got or had these little bits here which was a packing seal and then the main seal now these have been replaced with a one piece seal which is off a of Mark II but you know this was the, the sealing face here. Now in the past it has sealed but as you can see there it's, it's now tapered um, towards the rear so you know it, it's not, not sealing anymore basically and you could feel that the second I fired it. I only fired one shot and I knew straight away what was going on there um, having a, a Walther Century. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, and that's just a packing seal, I mean, that's just a plumbing washer, you know, nothing special there. This is the original spring, which was compacted with washers, just to make it nice and short. And to be honest with you, I don't even think this rifle was kicking out five foot pound. Um, and with a seal like that, definitely not. Um, they put the packing washers on the back of this here, so basically this inserts in and it's held in with a pin which compresses your spring. When that pin was removed, that didn't even budge. I had to physically pry that out, but when I put the Titan excess spring in from, from Nibs, John Nibs, that went straight in there, no problem. Oh, it didn't go in, no problem. It was it was a nightmare getting it in. Um, you know, it had to be properly compressed, um, you know. So keep that in mind if you ever do one of these. Um, but yeah, it you could tell the difference straight away. Um, that just wasn't going to have it. I mean, you can tell by the waviness that it's been compressed and it's seen better days. I, I do believe that's actually the original spring. But like I said, it's got a tight and excess main spring in there now. It's got a Mark II seal on it, you know, one piece seal. Uh, moving forward now onto the. Uh, now, this is quite a short stock. Um, normally, stocks sort of come forwards to about here. But the rifle, it feels short. It feels like teenager's rifle um, if you know what I mean which may have been what it was aimed at but it's quite a short sort of when you get on your shoulder everything feels quite rearwards if you know what I mean I mean the balance of it's about here which is ideal for sort of you know standing shots to be honest with you but when you, you go to rest it it's it's not the easiest thing in the world to rest um, I just don't get on with Webleys in general so I'm not really going to get into too much of that that's a bit wobbly but to be honest with you it's, it's not doing any real issues um, on the top there you have good old Webley and Scott Birmingham England which would now say Webley and Scott Limited made in Turkey um, two holes for the old rear sights which have been taken off um, I'll go into the breech block in a second in these jaws let me just get down the end of this 19 inch barrel um, it's a crown barrel I don't know if it's uh, I don't know if you can see that but Basically, you've got a nice bowl in there. Um, it did used to have a, a little foresight on there, as you can see. I mean, the blue in sort of held up over the test of time. Um, so let's go into this breech block now. That usually slams off the table at this point. Um, let me... Oh, yeah, we're dragging everything over. Right, okay, then. So this breech block. So um, in here, now these were known as Webley Wobbly, Wobbly Webleys. 
Um, and then at the time I got this, this barrel was wobbling sort of two millimeters left, back to center, two millimeters to the right. That's reversed on my hands, but you get the gist. Um, now I was looked on the internet, and this came down to the fact that a lot of people say that these jaws here splay out from cocking, so you pull a, a lever either way as you cock it, which bends these outwards. That's bollocks. Um, this is just ship machining, to be honest with you, from 1980s Britain. Um, or early 80s Britain. These were no different at the front than they were just before this fillet. It was exactly the same. These were perfectly parallel. And I had this on the uh, the table at where I work. Um, well, it wasn't actually my table, actually. It was a, a guy around the corner. Um, and this block here was perfectly parallel either side. All it needed was just a shim in there. And this is just typical crap machine intolerances, you know, stack ups. Um, probably done on paper and then some machinists just bashing them out in, in massive batches a day. Um, in here, so your, your barrel is basically heated into this block here. Um, so this is all from tip to toe. This isn't, you know, a separate piece. Uh, this is sort of fluted inwards or funneled in. So you drop your pellet in there and it literally drops down to about here. Um, which is a bit unnerving because you like to have a bit of a thumb show, but you just got to trust it. You close the barrel up and you're away to go. It locks off a little spring lever in there or spring plunger, um, which is chamfered top and bottom. And you've got a bar that goes through which locks it all in place. Your breech seal is on the rear. You're probably not going to be able to see that to be honest with you in this light. You can just make it out. But this was the old breech seal. Um, again, I don't know if it's going to focus, but you can see that's damaged. And looking at it, it was in that way. It looks to me like it's been kind of cocked pellet in and then you know kind of that old flick just to kind of lift the barrel up a terminator style um you know it was blowing air all over the place basically so not only was it not sealing no more not only was the spring inefficient um also the whole seal here was was gone as well um you know which is a bit of a, a bit of a shame really but you know that's that so ultimately what I did to stop this was to stop the wobble was to uh, to shim it I was an electrical switch with a really really thin wash I had two of them actually because I was going to put it down each side but I could only get one in I ended up punching a hole in so it was all you could uh, I ended up wasting one and then using the other if I was to do this again um, I would find two penny washers pressed washers and I would have this breech block machined recess slightly to take up to the exact dimension of here so you have a perfect space and possibly a little bit more probably half a thou or quarter of a thou wide uh, of an inch just to put a little bit of pressure onto them and um, to put it together i put this these in a vice and put on a hell of a torque more than i was comfortable with and to be honest with you you'd need to heat them up to make them move um you know so people who are putting these in vices there's a better way to do it lads you know um give the rifle a bit of justice it's lasted all these years you know you can make it last another 30 years if you do it right um let me just bring that back up again and lock that shut um the recall on this was quite strong and it was quite clear from the targets that i was shooting at the time that the, the scope was creeping back it's got no stops in there no arrest of stops so i ended up using this uh, grub screw uh, and wedging it in place there is a long-term fix with this um which i want to do but I need to know that this is going to work first. And so far it has done. It just needs to go down the range a bit and, and really work out what's going on. But you can see there it's starting to lean back. So it needs sort of sitting in there properly um, and a little bit of work doing. There is a design for that. I'm keeping that to myself because, you know, it's my design and, you know, knowledge is power, as they say. So we've seen all the components. We've had a look at the rifle. Um, we know what it was, well I've explained what it was doing previously, um, fire wise. So let's go have a look at this target that I've got down here on this high contrast, uh, very, very technical lunchbox lid. So everything in the red, essentially, and this is what I was saying about the diesel, and you can see it's it's got these black rings on it, so it's dieseling quite heavily. Um, the barrel's actually in, was really, really rusty, um, so, you know, I'm just letting that get in there, so all this, this grease gets in amongst it, and allows it to get like a little skin so I can get all the rust out of it which I've actually started to do you know it's, it's just about coming to the end of its dieseling cycle now and um, the way I see dieseling is yeah it's a bad thing just put a bit of stress on the uh, the spring but in reality it's just clearing out it's, it's like a loogie basically it's just coughing up all the crap that it don't need um, and getting rid of it you know 
Um, and I'm pretty, you know, it's not going to really damage the spring because I'm not doing it all the time. Um, it's able to fire everything out pretty easy. Like I said, I don't know if the barrel's choked or not. Anyway, enough waffle about that. Um, you know, if it breaks, I have to fix it. Simple as that. But I'm confident it ain't gonna. Um, so these were the first ones that I fired in red, and this was when I realised we had a major issue with scope creep. And this was on a one-piece mount as well. Bear in mind, and that was clamped to round about a torque of uh, FT as we use in the industry, which means tight. Um, this was my marking round. Move the scope over, got it on, fired one shot, two shots, three shots, four shots, five shots, six shots, seven. So by the time I'm getting to here, I'm sort of realising now that I've sorted out the wobble, you know, the wobbly barrel with a shim. Um, but I've got a scope creep, you know, there's something that's making that, that scope point down every single shot. And it didn't, you know, once I sort of realised, it took me a long time to work it out by the time I got here. You know, it's kind of, what on earth's going on? And then you get this, this oh, right, okay, another five shots later, I've figured it out. And the scope was pretty much back here somewhere, to be honest. Um, I decided at that point the best thing to probably do was to stop. <laughs> um, create this little, you know, block here, this little catch block. Use this, it's not doing anything to, to sort it all out. And we'll sort out a hardened screw later on. Um, went back the next night zeroed on these two, adjusted my scope, managed to shoot this group, um, decided to pull it back centre, you know, overshot it slightly because the scope's a bit different to the ones I use, Nico tend to adjust slightly more by the looks of it. Um, this is all at 15 yards, so half sort of range really. Um, managed to get nice groupings, worked out a way to fire it, um, but then I noticed I had this, now I thought it was scope creep, but it was actually sort of, this was my first one, uh, yeah, I thought it was scope creep, but it wasn't basically, the reticle was uh, jammed right up on the top there, so I knew that the scope needed shimming at this point, shim the scope, and I'm pretty confident that I'm going to be back down to pretty much pellet on pellet, once I get down to the uh, the range and fire it, just ignore that, that's a flyer. It slipped off the bag as I was shooting it. Um, when I tend to shoot this rifle, um, I don't know if anybody else finds this, but I shoot it in the prone position. I would fire it as this, um, but I would have my arm under here over the top, believe it or not. So my left hand come in from that side and physically pull it into the bag. Um, that's how much I have to restrict it. It's quite a quite an aggressive kick on it for such an old rifle. Um, but that's that's just a, a walkthrough basically of this rifle that I've got my hands on. I think it's good to sort of have a look at some of the older rifles as well as the new ones, you know, and, and report on them and a quick review on them. Um, some people might find it useful, some people might not. You might have some collectors there that don't have one in the collection been on and are and about it. Well, there you go, you've got some kind of a something to work off. Um, I don't know what the value of this rifle is. Um, now it's got most of its guts hanging out. Um, and been replaced it's probably not worth a lot I don't think the pristine ones are worth more than 120 quid out fresh out of the box or the original packing so I don't know what this would be worth the guy was interested so if you do know then you know feel free to comment at the bottom um, and as always feel free to comment at the bottom I'll try and answer any questions I can but again this isn't my rifle I haven't spent much time with it um, I'll just pull it to pieces basically and give it a good service and put it back together for me mate um, as always, feel free to comment, don't troll, um, and like I said, any comments you've got, yeah, I'll love to try to answer them. In the meantime, stay safe and shoot straight. Thanks, bye.